Hey everyone, welcome back to the workbench. Dan here as always, and in this video we'll be looking at some of the projects that I've completed. And I've been very busy, as you can see, with lots of uh, different things. And I've also been working on the model railroad, and we'll kind of touch upon all that. And also some changes I've kind of made to my, I guess, inventory of cars and different things that I've collected. Uh, I've been going through a lot of selling and things like that, so we'll uh, talk about that real quick. So I've just been at a point in this hobby where I'm really just trying to decide what needs to stay and what needs to go. What I really want to keep and what just doesn't need to be there anymore. As you guys know, I have a large fleet of cars that I sort through and I ended up selling about 20 or 30 uh, finished models just to get them out of the way because I just had no place for them and I had nowhere to store them and I just figured that it would be better to just move those out of the way until storage becomes better, uh, more readily available until I can get some more boxes prepared to actually properly store cars um, and I've purged quite a few cars off I sold a few locomotives as well and I have quite a number of locomotives too that don't have DCC and since I'm moving into the DCC field a lot of them uh, just require so much work that I just don't know if it's worth it so I've sold off and purged quite a few engines in particular all of my blue box equipment is gone so I had a number of Jeep 38s and GP 40s that were from old RTR lines when they were all blue box shells and I just went ahead and sold those off for simplicity that way I can replace models or basically upgrade them with better more modern Genesis or Atherin RTRs that are more easily convertible for ditch lights uh, DCC that kind of thing among other things I've also sold off a quite an extensive fleet of unweathered cars in particular ones that have been out in my garage and storage for all, going on almost five years now these are what I have left over, but originally I had way more cars out here. I had probably about 50 other models that were piled up, including more modern locomotives. Uh, these two aren't mine here, they're for a friend, but uh, a lot of these are all uh, empty. But there are a few, like these Jeevos are uh, in box and a couple of scale trains, new Atherin stuff. But uh, I sold off tons of rolling stock and I've really narrowed my fleet down to what I really want to keep. And what I can really use, like my real box cars, LPG cars, assorted tank cars, uh, lots of hoppers and things like that, Intermountain hoppers, uh, all that stuff, some auto racks, some kits to build stuff, some Walters uh, mainline stuff. Um, but I feel a lot better, and I've been able to raise quite a bit of money. I've saved a lot of money um, getting rid of all those extra trains, and it just feels great knowing that I've been able to really limit down to what I know I want and have everything else, all the scrap material, out of the way. So it's a, a great relief. So getting into some of the models that I've completed, I just recently got four of the new American Limited release two-bay covered hoppers. These are the Trinity versions. I had four of these originally, but uh, they were unfortunately some of the cars where I had originally weathered them and I just wasn't happy with the weathering, so I decided to replace them with some new fresh schemes. And I got two of these GNAX DJJ patched cars here and these are super nice uh, these are cement cars in real life I believe so I tried to model the cement spillage running down the sides of the car I did this technique with a little bit of oil paint and I just pulled the paint down with a little bit of thinner and a flat bristle brush and it does a really nice job of creating these really fine streaks uh, I also added the safety striping and I added the underbay grime kick up spray and everything like that and on the top it has the treads or rather the anti-skid paint and I like to do this effect by blotching on acrylic with a paintbrush and then I take a q-tip that's been damped and I just basically blotch it over that fresh paint and it starts to pull some of that paint up and it creates this really nice effect and if I actually take and move this car in you can see what I'm talking about you can see that texture uh, it's very realistic to what you see on a lot of these more modern cars and I really like doing that effect. Uh, I did some cement uh, spillage excuse me, around these hatches. Now, I would like to go back and maybe add a little bit more texture. And what I was thinking of doing was actually taking real cement or maybe some like tile grout or something like that and just very carefully blotching it around. But that's a project for another day. Uh, for the most part, the covered hopper itself is finished. You can see there's a number of little like rust pits and things like that down the side uh, that really enhance the look of the model and if we turn it to the opposite side you can see we pretty much have the exact same thing uh, you can really see that streaking on this side it's a lot more prominent the next car I did was GNAX 2628 this is the second one I finished and this is a little bit more heavily 
caked up with cement. You can see it's really heavily streaked down the side of the car, almost obliterating the reporting marks and covering everything up. Uh, pretty much the standard weathering and kick up and grime on the trucks, the underbase, uh, kick up on the ends. Uh, we have the grime and everything on the top, along with the anti-skid paint, which I've applied, uh, as mentioned before. Did some washes on other parts, like the walkways and things like that, just to dirty them up and give them that uh, realistic texture. And on the opposite side, pretty much the same. You'll notice that there's really no graffiti on any of these. I wanted to kind of keep these just as staples for the weathering. Uh, some of these cars do have graffiti, but I wanted to keep these particular prototypes pretty clean. If we look at the underbody of the car, you can see that splatter, and I really love to do that effect. It's just very easy. You just take a large bristle paintbrush and then dip your paint, uh, mix it in with a little bit of water, and then you just basically splatter it using a straight edge against the base. I've demonstrated this technique in a number of other videos. Uh, it's pretty simple to do, and it always is very effective for covered hoppers, especially these bright gray ones where everything's very uh, visible. The kick-up effects are real nice on the ends of these cars as well. You can see they're nice and splattered up. And I used a combination of airbrushing, a little bit of powder work, and then I used the same brush technique to splatter up the paint to make it look like uh, flicker from the trucks as the wheels pick up moisture and rust and grime off the rails and splatter it up. This next car here is a CMEX version and I just basically did some light washes down the sides of this. I darkened up the panel seams and it's just my typical effect. I like to take a large brush, not exactly this large, but you just basically take and load it up with flat earth powder and then take most of the powder off the brush and then go down the side like this kind of scraping into the side of the car and it creates this really nice build-up effect of grime in these little seams. It's very simple to do. It also builds up on the little raised surfaces like these little tack boards, uh, these little jacking pads, and other little fine details. As long as you're not, you know, damaging anything, the technique works really well. Uh, one of the great things about this car too is you can see the scratches. I like to model the scratches by going down with sandpaper and modeling those side scrapes. Uh, I also added a little bit of graffiti to this one, the safety striping, and the top portion of the car is very nice because it has a lot of that rusted up uh, grime work and everything like that accomplished with oils. You can see I did the anti-skid paint and then just rusted up that a little bit and that created this really really nice effect at the top of the roof. And if we look at the opposite side of the car, I've replicated some really cool graffiti here on this one and I'm very happy with how it came out. I just basically copied this from photos of a similar CMX car, put everything together and then just weathered over it to blend it in together and it made this really nice effect. The last American Limited car is an NAHX version and you can see I just basically weathered this exactly the same as the others. Uh, just some light panel washes, grimed up these little weld seams, lots of grime and rust on the underbody. I modeled a brand new wheel on this one as well, or a place wheel rather, with some fresh rust powders. Uh, it's got all the nice grime and wash effects, all done with oils and acrylics. And at the top you can see that really wonderful looking uh, tread, tread paint. All nicely weathered up, it's starting to peel away, the hatches are all grimed up and it's a beautiful effect. And if we turn the car over to the opposite side, you can see it's just very plain, very basic, just again focusing on weathering, and it's a very nice modern in-service car. These two cars here are very unique. These are Wheeling and Lake Erie aggregate cars that were originally patched for DJJ, Joseph Transportation, Nuker Company. And these are Walther's cars that I basically detailed up. And I wanted to model some of these, not only because I really wanted to use my DJJ decals that I got custom done, but I wanted to model specific two-bay prototypes for aggregate service. And these Wheeling and Lake Erie hoppers were exactly what I was looking for. Uh, they have this very unique patching down the side. These are completely custom painted. And I tried to replicate this weird roll-on patch job that they did where they just touched everything up with red paint. And if you look real closely, you can kind of see, especially on this one back here, the uh, 230-004, that really interesting patch detail. I wanted to replicate that, and so I just painstakingly masked everything off and then carefully worked areas in at a time with an airbrush, blended things out, and then weathered over everything. Once I got all that done, I went in and added all of my custom decals. I added the patch reporting marks, safety striping, and then I added some new end details like coupler cut bars, air hoses, new KD couplers on both of these cars, and I upgraded the trucks uh, with metal wheels and everything like that uh, to make them more realistic. The weathering on these is really nice too as well. You can see there's a lot of grime, there's a lot of dust and kick up on the underbase. There's a lot of dust on the trucks and all kinds of other nice little details. 
as you really look at the side of the car, you can see what I was talking about with all the nice weathering effects. And I really love this aggregate splatter from a lot of the mud and the dust kind of streaked down as rain kind of washes it back off. I really like that effect. As you can see, it's on both sides here, if I demonstrate this here. You can see it's just splattered all over the place, and it's a really nice, dirty, in-service car. And I'm not really sure if I want to add loads to these or not. I haven't really gotten there yet, but you can see that the interiors are prepped with fresh rust to look like uh, they just were loaded or unloaded. Uh, so all I would really need to do is add a false core to these and then add some ballast, and they'd pretty much be ready to go. But I've loved the interiors of these cars so much after they came out uh, so awesome that I just haven't... Uh, gotten around to actually loading them yet but uh, the weathering again is really really nice on these and I'm very happy with how it looks if we look at the opposite car here and I move these out of the way you guys can see the 230-004 here in great detail and again I really love that patch job the way I came out it just uh, perfect it really was spot on and you can look up photos of these real cars and you can kind of see uh, what I was trying to recreate here with this patchwork here we have a very fun build that I just completed. This is a WWPX Trash Gondola, and these cars are famous because these were converted from old Canadian bulkhead flat cars, and they basically built new ends, floors, sides, and some supporting bits in between to modify these for C&D service. Now, I'm modeling a trash train for my Flastoria Model Railroad, and many of these cars come through, and in this case, this exact car, was one I got photographs of and I proceeded to replicate it. So I took a Walther's bulkhead flat car and just detailed it up basically, added tons of details, uh, all kinds of new parts like this uh, ribbing on the underbody or the undersill was custom done with styrene. I added the brand new sides and ends with styrene, mostly 040 inch styrene. I uh, added some grab irons and other little details like that and then I proceeded to custom paint the cars flat black and then I proceeded to go in and do all the prototype graffiti. On this side you can see it's a combination of a lot of older artwork that's been rusted over and grimed up quite a bit. And it also appears to have some fire damage, the real prototype does, because there's a lot of heavy rust. And occasionally the loads do catch on fire in these cars, believe it or not, because a lot of it is paper product and stuff like that, a lot of scrap uh, wood and all kinds of things like that. And you can imagine some chemicals might get in there, it gets hot enough, it can combust. And so this one does have some fire damage, which I thought was interesting. Uh, uh, basically for all the weathering, I first went in with a whitewash and basically whitewashed the entire model to fade it down a little bit. Once I did that, I followed behind with oils and I did some sponge techniques. I did some hand painting techniques where I tried to model little pits, gouges, and scratches. And then I went in and went a little further and using a pair of pliers, I bent up the top cord of the car to make it look like it's very beat up and aged because these cars do get very beat up in real service. And then I went in and then finished up applying safety striping added the uh, new decals, the reporting marks and everything like that and then just weathered everything to blend everything together and that worked out very very nice. This car also features a custom scrap CND load which is made from real CND materials and a bunch of styrene and metal scrap that I have lying around in uh, little storage containers after a lot of my projects. Uh, it's a great way to make realistic convincing CND loads for these cars. Here on the opposite side you can again see all the prototype graffiti which I hand painted uh, using several different photos. Uh, this one has a nice big hole in the side of the car as well if you can see that. It's not really uh, pretty cool. And then there's a lot of grime weathering, a lot of mud splatter caked on there, all kinds of old and new graffiti. Uh, you got the beat up safety striping, lots of rust done with some powder work. Uh, very nice detail weathering to the trucks. Uh, again, uh, KD couplers and all the detailed parts were added to complete the look of the model. Here you really get to see the detail in the load. I really like making these CND loads. They always come out really, really nice. Here in this zoomed in shot, you can just see the amount of layering that it takes to do one of these cars. It's a lot of, a lot of grime work, a lot of build up with powders, uh, a little bit of technique using some splatter with oils and acrylics. Uh, it comes out really nice if you can do it right. So three very unique cars that I have are these Scale Trains coil cars, and these are from the very first release. So I have both versions of the CHTT uh, UPE type reporting mark, and then I have a CSX version. But first off, I'm going to show you the 100-400. I just very carefully weathered everything up with powders, oils, and some other washes. I liked the weathering on the truck, so I tried to replicate that with acrylic paints, and then I went in and did some powder washes and everything like that. Uh, detailed up the ends a little bit. 
and then I try to do some oil and sponge techniques to kind of model some of the rust and you can see there's a, a lot of focus on the rust streaking down from the little support and this little track at the top of the car and coming down from these little um, handles for the uh, handrail that runs along the length of the car. Uh, these are fun to weather but they're also a little bit of a challenge because you have this large photo etch walkway in the way so trying to get your brushes in between that car can be a little bit tricky uh, but it's worth it in the end if you can get the uh, the details right. On this side of the car you can see I modeled a little bit of scribble graffiti I just replicated this from photos to try to uh, uh, make it look a little bit more interesting add some interest to the car and I'm very happy with the effects here uh, everything ties together really well on this model the second car I did has a lot more rust and as you can see I really tried to focus in on a lot of that rust pitting and basically gouging and all of that rust built up streaking down the hood and uh, it's a very cool effect but it takes a long time to do it uh, you have to just build up the washes and then streak them down and then basically correct and uh, basically straighten your lines uh, because trying to work your brush down round surfaces a lot of times the brush starts to wiggle a little bit even if you have the most steady hand in the world uh, a lot of times the brushes will wiggle and then your streaks start to look kind of wonk, uh, kind of funky they'll start to look kind of wavy so it takes a, a real good hand to just very carefully go down and pull that paint down but if you can do it you get this really nice effect here on this car as well I try to model the beat up safety striping so you can see some of its peeling away and a lot of its actually starting to rust over and on the opposite side of the car, we have pretty much the same thing. There's a nice big rusty blotchy patch there, which I tried to model with powder. Again, the beat up safety striping is done there. We got a little bit of scribble graffiti work, and then lots of rust pits and heavy streaking coming down the top of the car. I also did a little bit of sponge effect here to try to model some blotchy rust. It's just starting to form on the top of that coil. The CSX version here is one of the more modern repaints. I believe that these were done in... Um, I want to say 2015. Uh, so a lot of these are obviously in still pretty good condition, but uh, some of them have faded down quite a bit. Some of them are, of course, covered in graffiti and rust. But uh, I tried to keep this one kind of a happy medium here. Really, I just focused on weathering up the trucks, putting the kick-up grime and everything like that on the ends. And I tried to just do some light streaking coming down from the supports, from the walkway railing supports, and from this little track at the top along with this little lift ring here. And it just all very lightly comes down. Uh, I did a very light fade. You can see that there's still some gloss to that paint, but it's a lot more subdued because out of the box this was a very glossy, fresh car. Uh, so I just faded it down a little bit. I, of course, put the DOT safety tape on there, weathered up the wheels very nicely, and the cars come out really well. Just like all the others, this car does have some graffiti, a very small piece right here. Wrapping up this video for now, I have a cool leaser that I just finished building. Uh, this is a CEFX SD40M-2. This is CEFX 3140. Uh, so basically the story on these locomotives, um, a lot of these were rebuilt from SD45 cores that they mainly got from uh, Santa Fe and Southern Pacific and possibly some other roads. And they basically reconditioned and converted these locomotives with 645 prime movers and upgraded them to Dash 2 specs, but they retained the SD45 car bodies. And these came at a time when well, a lot of the railroads were short on power, mainly CSX, Norfolk Southern, and um, these were basically built by a French company called Alstom. And they acquired quite a few of these locomotives, built them up for capital equipment financing, and then they sent these out into lease service. There was quite a number of these, and all of them went to CSX originally and they ran all the way up through 2007 before a majority of them were returned and eventually over time a number of these migrated to different railroads uh, some of them went here and there CSX released a couple and in this case 3140 went back to CSX for a short time in 2015 all the way up through 2016 and eventually this got sold off to another railroad but I've modeled this locomotive as it appeared kind of circa 2017 ish uh, and so it's basically a completely upgraded Atherin RTR locomotive and this one has been completely overhauled uh, so I basically went through stripped all the details off using a former Southern Pacific locomotive just like the prototype and I went in added a cab interior I added new pilot details on the trucks the fuel tank I added all the appropriate detail parts like uh, plumbing fittings piping uh, waste retention tanks 
and on the trucks you can see I've modified these to have the exposed bearings, the Tim Ken bearings, uh, because on CSX they like to take these bearing covers off, the Hyatt bearing covers, uh, to expose the bearing caps, and then a lot of times they'll mark these with white with spray paint to indicate uh, or show that they're actually rolling. So I've also done uh, some extensive hood detailing. I have added the lift rings. I added the new K3 style air horn, the conduit running all the way to the cab, the AC cover, new antennas on the cab itself. I added the little deflectors, mirrors, sunshades, and on the nose, it retained its original SP style nose light. I added some new grab irons, a, a couple of little details here and there. And we'll work our way around the model just to show you guys all the other details that I've done to this thing. But of course, it's also received a complete custom paint job, uh, heavy weathering, and of course, final detailing. And she's a real nice locomotive. If we look at the front of this locomotive, you can see I've added all of the appropriate details, the large style snowplow. I added the grab irons, ditch lights. I added a couple of cut bars, drop steps, MU jumpers, and all the appropriate receptacles according to the prototype. Uh, the cab details are also very nice, you can kind of see them here. I added the extra grab irons because that's something that they also retrofitted to a lot of these SD45s during the rebuilds. And if we just look in that cab, you can actually see the EMD control stand with the gauges applied in there. And there's also a speed recorder up here, but it's hard to see. And I also installed seats as well. As we look down the top of the hood, you can see there's all kinds of very nice rust and grime effects that I did with the numerous uh, brush techniques, things like that, to build up the washes. There's a lot of fading and chipping, uh, something I really like to focus on with these older locomotives. You can see the fans are all rusted up and grimed up. Uh, you can see all the heavy soot and everything that's built up and it, uh, over time streaked down from the grills and worked its way down the car body hood. You can see there's a lot of grime filling in those doors as well. And you can see all that nice rust coming in from all the different little parts there. Here you can see how I've replicated a lot of the sill chipping. This is a full reflective sill stripe, so I added real reflective tape and then the so basically a white band and then the yellow bands as well that were added later. On the trucks, you can see all the dust and mud effects that's done with oils, and then the fuel tank features all the nice streaking, mud splatter, and everything like that. And you can see that there's actually some fuel tank scratches that run down the uh, length of the fuel tank. That's something that you see on a lot of modern locomotives. As we look down the long hood, you can see all the custom details that I've also applied. I custom did the light box here, which was modified on the CEFX units. I added all the appropriate details to the pilot. There's tons of very nice weathering. The other big challenge on the rear hood here is that the SP model out of the box came with number boards. The real locomotives never had number boards, so I had to carefully remove and sand everything down flush, and then I carefully built everything up with putty and primer to fill everything in. I then added the original class light knockout plates, like I said, the new light package cover there, and all the appropriate details. Then the whole thing got custom painted. And just as a little bonus here, I do have some other locomotives that I'm working on, and this one is another GM leaser. This one is from one of the newer releases of Atherin locomotives that they did in the Ferrix scheme. And I thought this would just be a simple conversion to make it into an EM, from an, basically an EMD locomotive to a GMD locomotive. So this one would have been a Canadian CP Rail SD40. And I used the Atherin model thinking I could just add a nose light and add some other details. Wrong. For one thing, the paint is very poor on the newer Atherin runs. Uh, the green is just straight up wrong. The other issue is that they modeled these earlier Furex locomotives with silver paint. The early paint schemes were actually a whitish gray, like a white ghost gray. So I had to actually repaint all the gray on this locomotive and I repainted all the green on this locomotive to the appropriate colors. I added all the appropriate GM style details so you can see this locomotive has a nose light and it has the modified number boards with the blank plate there. I've added all kinds of appropriate Canadian style details. This has the dual jacking pads. So you can see that there's two jacking pads on each end of the locomotive. That's a uh, Canon and Company part. I made the custom coupler bars, lift rings with ditch lights, and I've just started scratch building the front handrails. Uh, obviously this is a work in progress. I'm working on the chassis right now as well. And i got to paint the handrails and do some other detailing and start working on the deck a little bit more. But this will be a work in progress and I'll be able to bring this back in another video coming up soon when it's finished. And you guys can see all the beautiful work that I've done to this locomotive.
And just another little peek into the future here. This is another Alstom GMD SD40 that I'm currently in the process of building up. It's going through an, uh, basically a heavy overhaul and a conversion, basically making it from an American EMD locomotive to a Canadian GMD built locomotive. So I'm modifying a bunch of different parts and following prototype guidelines to match the build exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, this is going to be a Grey Ghost uh, XCP rail GCFX Alstom later patched to CITX, it'll be 3079. Uh, you guys can look up photos of that locomotive to give you an idea of what it is. These were again very common on CSX in the 2000s and they worked their way around all the way up through 2015, 2016 and even up to 2017 I can recall seeing some of these uh, roaming around here and there. Uh, but again a lot of these unfortunately have been scrapped and sold off but I still like to model a lot of these to have them running around just as kind of a reminiscence of what I remember seeing and what I like to build of course too so this is another big work in progress and there's a lot of work to do but I think possibly by the end of October I should be able to have this locomotive finished it's in the very early stages of building you can see I've already added the lift rings I've modified the grills and I just started working on the chassis. This isn't the exact chassis for the locomotive. This is actually the chassis for the Furix locomotive, the 3011, which I showed previously. Uh, but this shell is just mounted on here temporarily. That way I can more easily uh, work on the shell without it uh, risking bending or anything like that. It'll sit up flat while I work on the roof, for example, and also work on the cab interior here. You can see I've already mounted the engineer's control console. And I gotta modify and do some seats, add some decals, and then also modify a set of LEDs here to run to the nose light. Alright guys, well I want to wrap up out here because this is the biggest uh, portion of a time hog that I have in this hobby right now. Uh, just dedicating time out here, getting some hours in, trying to finish up all the track, and uh, also do some scenery work and cleaning stuff and then preparing some new sections. Uh, just basically getting them prepped for scenery because we're at a point now where I have the layout running. I can essentially run a train around this thing now. Uh, there are still some parts track wise where I can't because I haven't put in feeders, uh, for example in the CNO yard section over here, but for the most part on the mainline tracks all the way around, all 100 feet of this thing, I can run a train around. I only have one locomotive that's DCC equipped right now that's programmed and is able to run on this layout. Uh, but in time we'll be able to program and get some more locomotives prepped and I'll actually be able to start running some trains out here which is very exciting because obviously I can now see uh, really what this thing will be like and be able to start enjoying some of the fruits of my labor. Out in this section here, this is going to be a brand new section of track that I just laid in. This is the NS Mixing Center lead and this comes off the NS yard and leads into, in real life, the BNO yard, which is over here, the yard off to the east past the crossing. And this was something I did not model originally. I don't know why I didn't, but I'd never put this track in originally when I built this layout. I recently added it, and this was a little bit of work, but I wanted to add it, and it ended up working out really well. So I have a whole video of me adding this track, doing some scenery work, adding trees, ballast, and you guys will be able to stay tuned for that. That'll be coming up here pretty soon. I'll actually be able to show you guys how I did all of this work, adding a track, building a crossing. Uh, you'll be able to see my thought process and how I did all this scenery work, and you'll be able to kind of get in my brain a little bit. So it'll give you guys something interesting to watch here coming up, and that should be the next video uh, after this is uploaded. So you guys can keep an eye out for that. In this corner over here, I've already started prepping the track. I had done some repairs in this turnout section, I think I've mentioned that, uh, and I had to do some repairs and relay some track in here. So all the track here and all these switches, if I just pan down real quick, all these switches for my center siding have been replaced with insole frog turnouts or unifrog turnouts. The unifrog and insole frogs are both good. Uh, so I've replaced all that track there and all this section here is essentially ready for paint and ballast but I'm at a point right now where I really want to do some final planning to the section and decide if I absolutely want to stick with a basic scenery layout kind of following to what's around here or if I want to maybe add some more details maybe put in like a drainage ditch or something like that you know really just trying to decide if there's any other little elements that I might want to put in maybe like a little side road or something like that I'm still trying to keep this relatively prototypical to what's there in real life 
Um, there would be a transfer track in real life. These two main lines would not curve off here in real life. They keep going west. And then there would be a single Y track. And then over here somewhere, the CNO on the Fostoria main line would run across here. But obviously it's a model road. I can't have everything. <laughs> so this track would curve off. And I still wanted to kind of keep it somewhat prototypical with the scenery. But for the most part, it's outside of Fostoria, Ohio, in this area, boring fields, empty fields. And I don't necessarily want to model crop fields. I feel like there's other things I could potentially model. So I'm really just trying to decide exactly what I want in the scene. You know, maybe I want some fencing. Maybe I want some uh, dirt field, maybe a drainage ditch, like I said. So I'm just kind of at a point where I need to decide. And then once I have a decent enough plan that I can actually stick with, I'll go in, I'll finish painting the track. Because you can kind of see where I've stopped painting the track. And then I can actually start finishing the scene. And of course, I'll put ballast down first and then follow in with grass and everything like that. So if you recall, I had a number of shorts out here and a few of them were actually related to some of the sections over here. Um, we had a hump in the track for one thing where the modules actually bunched together and we had um, some contact. I forget exactly what it was, but basically we had a small short out here that we had to correct. Uh, fortunately, it was very easy. All I had to do was come in here, cut out a section of track, and I replaced it with a new section of track here. Uh, added some additional feeders, and all this powers through very nicely. Where we are with the track in the yard section, so this would be two track main, center siding, over here would be yard track three, yard track two, and then yard track one. These tracks right now are currently not powered. I have not laid in feeder wires yet, so well, this is dead. So I will be putting in feeder wires here, uh, one set at the end of each module. Uh, so that'll be the next process. So that's going to be one of the big things I'm going to really wrap up. I can probably get the rest of this done in a few weeks here uh, when I get some more time. I just basically got to go in, like I said, and put in some feeder wires, and this will be prepped and ready to go. One of the big things I did out here as well was also replace the switches in this section. As you can see, they're not tacked down yet. We were doing some final adjustments. Uh, we got to add, uh, I think, maybe one more set of feeders here. Maybe. Really doesn't need it, but it would probably be good in the long run to have those. Uh, but this is basically another turnout section we replaced with Unifrog and Electro... or not an Electrofrog, but Unifrog and Inselfrog switches. Uh, to fix the problem that we were having out here with this uh, short circuit. So we got that replaced uh, and then all this yard track again here just needs wired up and this will be ready to go. As for all this track out here, I did get some feeder wires in. So all three of the yard tracks in the yard entrance, so the yard lead is up here where the two switches are. All that is powered and the two mainline tracks are also powered. There's not too much to say in this section. I did replace this switch here from an Electrofrog to an uh, ele uh, Inselfrog uh, since I was replacing the switches. I had a short circuit here originally where sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't, so I just took that switch out and replaced it and now I don't have any problems. As you can see, it's all wired up and ready to go. Over in the turnout section here, I had to repair the curve because I had a bunch in the track on all three of these tracks where it kinked. Um, from just the cold temperatures and then just the normal amount of adjustment in stretching that the track does where it starts to bend. Uh, it kinked up and so I had to replace that section and I was able to repair that. Uh, that will just need painted and I can blend the scenery back in over there. Now in this section here uh, we didn't have any problems. All we had to do when we repaired this track work uh, was just come in, just polish and clean everything, and then I also did some repairs to the ballast. Uh, you can see there's a section here where I got some cracks. Uh, I need to repair these a little bit. I need to fill that in. Uh, you can see I actually got some models on the layout. These are some of my salt cars, and these are all waiting to go. I'll probably r try to run a train out here at some point with these cars, and uh, actually be able to start doing some tests and stuff, and actually really get to see uh, an actual train operate, which is getting exciting. Uh, in terms of some small details, I also added a mile post right there, which is there in real life. That's just a concrete post. I added these pull lines in the weeds, in the bush. Uh, these are actually there in real life. These are just old telephone poles that have been long since abandoned. And as you can see, they run the entire length of the yard section on the outer edge of the track. And in real life, in the B&O, uh, these used to be there. They were unfortunately cut down and uh, since been taken out, but I wanted to have them there uh, because they're cool. It's, it's neat to have that little element of history. 
Uh, you can see here we also have to do some repairs on the ballast here in this little section so I'm going to come in here and I'll repair that we'll take care of that little gap there. Other than that really not too much else out here again just ran that pull line everything out here now this section was the fun repair because over here um, this track had a kink and I had a short circuit as well from this switch here so I ended up replacing this section of track on these modules uh, right here and in the yard and then after I did all the track repairs I added some new feeders and then I blended the ballast back in to repair that uh, so it meant that I had to take up the uh, signal bridge which is annoying because I didn't really want to have to but I ended up having to so I took that out added some other little details after I got everything uh, up and running again one of the things I had to replace was this switch in here I replaced this turnout here with a U, uh, uh, Insel frog, not an electrofrog, I gotta not say electrofrog because originally this was an electrofrog and I replaced it with an Insel frog and then all the way through here it just did some basic ballast repairs and then all in this turnout you can see where I've added a new switch and that new section of the track but we're not going to talk about that for now uh, we'll wait that way you guys can see all this get done in the, uh, up video, uh, the upcoming video anyways uh, so yeah we've definitely gotten a lot of done out here uh, we still got more to do but we'll get it done and we'll get it wrapped up uh, but for now that's what I wanted to show you guys with the layout Well guys, that about wraps it up. Of course, I love showing you guys the products I'm working on, and I always like to try to post pictures and everything when I can on my social media. Uh, but for now, if you guys like this content, be sure to subscribe here on YouTube if you haven't already, and I'll be sure to kind of keep showing you guys and keep you guys posted on what I'm working on, whether it be locomotives or freight cars. And of course, we'll keep showing you guys the model road here whenever I can. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do, but I'll keep you guys posted on that. And again, I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this video. And until next time, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.